Time flies quickly. February has already arrived. In Ukraine, February is referred to as Liuti, fierce. I believe the name doesn't need translation. In recent years, this fierce month has transformed into a gentle one. No snow, warmth, sunshine. It's the perfect time for new discoveries. Traveling alone feels somber, so I invited my neighbors, those creative retirees I've mentioned before, and together we set off in search of historical relics. Back in the last century, many villages in Ukraine were graced with windmills, known here as Vatraki, windmills. Over time, most of these windmills were not spared, disappearing either as firewood or succumbing to decay. However, in some remote villages, a few windmills still stand, and I was eager to catch a glimpse of them. This classic windmill is located in the village of Tikline, Cherkasy Oblast. It was built in 1907 by Vasil Manko. If not for his great-grandchildren and caring villagers who restored the windmill, preserving its historical appearance, Vasil's windmill would have met a tragic fate. Of course, it wasn't possible to fully restore its original interior tough times struck the country. Revolutions, famine, war, chaos, and much was lost. Yet, the heart of the windmill, its inner mechanical core, has partially endured. This windmill has three levels. Most windmills were built shorter in height to withstand the winds. However, the low height hindered the creation of large wings affecting productivity. This code holds the key to uncovering the detailed history of the windmill. On the ground floor where the pivot post is located, grain and finished products were stored. Space here is quite limited. A staircase leads to the second floor, where millstones and equipment for regulating the quality of flour grinding are placed. There's also an exit to the balcony on this level. The third floor is the most intriguing. It houses the working mechanisms, the wind shaft itself, to which the blades are attached, the main gears that connect with the millstones and the lifting mechanism. I can't fathom how they managed to haul such a heavy shaft up here. Cranes weren't available in the village back then. Grain was poured into this trough, which would then cascade onto the stone millstones for grinding. The flour would slide down a chute leading to the second floor, where it was received. About 60 kilometers from here, there's another windmill where the internal mechanisms have been fully preserved. Currently, that windmill houses a museum. I'm planning to visit there next time and take a look. I'll definitely share the experience on my channel. In Ukraine, besides windmills, there were also water mills situated along rivers. Some villagers even had manual hand mills for grinding small batches of flour. I'll be on the lookout for these relics, as I'm sure they've been preserved somewhere. It's truly intriguing. I'll showcase these discoveries in the upcoming episodes. Сань, я боюсь, что назад потом, а если вдруг туда нет дороги, Сань. Давайте пишем. Мы зараз здесь встанем так, чтобы можно, чтобы мы знаем, что мы разведем. Нет, дорога туда где-то есть. Так мы сможем пешки пойти. Я продолжаю путешествовать по окрестным деревням в поисках старины. И нашел одно из Чудес, просто чудес, которые еще остались здесь, в Украине. Вы не поверите, это настоящее приключение. It's marvelous that Ukrainians care about their history and prevent it from disappearing. But I wanted to touch genuine antiquity, untouched by modern restoration. I couldn't believe it's possible today. Yet, it is possible. Such relics of the past are still preserved in the depths, 
This windmill is located on the outskirts of the village of Kivitki. It looks like a weathered pirate from times long gone, standing in worn attire on the edge of a deserted island cliff, gazing into the distance of the ocean, awaiting rescue. In Ukraine, two types of windmills are common. The Dutch, with a cap structure, and the German, with a tower structure. The Dutch type rotated only the head with the blades to adjust to the wind, while the German type rotated the entire body. This windmill is precisely the German type, revolving around the massive central pillar. The first windmills arrived in Ukraine from Europe around the 17th century, though exact records are absent. Initially, people perceived them as evil forces and feared approaching, thinking that malevolent energy resided within. No wonder Don Quixote battled windmills. At the beginning of the 20th century, Cherkasy Oblast had around 8,000 windmills, but today only about 20 remain in one condition or another. It's a pity that this windmill stands neglected by villagers. It's a beautiful spot, with a splendid view. Windmills are like symbols of resilience. If they vanish, the distinct charm of this marvelous corner of central Ukraine will fade away. While traveling on Google Maps, I stumbled upon a photo of a unique church that surprised me with its unconventional shape and architecture. Now we're on our way to visit it. Everyone knows that the photos pinned on Google Maps don't always match the actual location. I was worried that there might be nothing there, but this time it turned out to be true. This wonder stands exactly where it's indicated. The Holy Trinity Church in the village of Drabovtsi is a true masterpiece of 18th century wooden architecture. The church is active and services are held within its walls. It's a pity that we arrived too late and missed the early morning service, thus couldn't enter the church. This church has an interesting history. It was relocated three times in search of the best spot within the village, and only in 1905 did it find its permanent home, where it stands to this day. Following the trends of its time, the church underwent several alterations, incorporating new elements into its structure and changing its original appearance. As a result, it now resembles a Carpathian temple, a style not typical for the Dnieper region. There are no more such churches to be found in the Cherkasy region. The reason behind this lies in the restoration process, which involved craftsmen from western Ukraine. At first glance, the white clay extension of the church catches the eye, not quite fitting with the wooden interior of the structure. This is the treasury room, added later. Nonetheless, this wooden creation of human hands harmoniously blends with the white cottages and the rural landscape, creating an unexpected yet soulful atmosphere for the Holy Trinity Church. It's a shame that the ongoing war prohibits drone flights, preventing us from capturing its full beauty. In spring, when the apricot trees bloom, the place will become even more beautiful, warmer and brighter. There's a reason to visit again, especially since on the left bank of the Dnipro River, other historical landmarks from even more ancient times are preserved. Those are the ones we'll be searching for. Это то, что я искал, вы не поверите, вот она, под соломой, но это даже не солома, это камышом она накрыта, но тоже тот же принцип, вот стены, вот она мазанка, вот она старая, сейчас я обойду вокруг, смотрите, вот она, старина, все уже завалено, к сожалению. Остатки побелочки еще. 
Saloma. This is a classic old mud hut. Inside, there's only one small room with a stove and a sleeping platform. The stove's design is interesting and differs from the stoves found in houses along the right bank of the Dnieper River. This stove doesn't have an external chimney and a substantial hearth, nor does it have shelves for pots. A hanging wooden shelf is attached to the front of the stove. In each region, there were local stove builders whose work could indicate the master's origin from a specific area. Amazingly, this stove hasn't fallen apart. Just imagine. Children used to huddle on this stove while the owner and guests sat at this table sipping moonshine from that jug. And outside, the blizzard would howl. After all, it's fiercely cold, and in the past, these places were full of snow, and the frost was no joke. I vaguely remember from my childhood how in winter, when I stayed with my grandmother in the village, I tried to climb onto the stove. It seemed to me that there was something unknown and intriguing in the darkness up there. But my grandmother scolded me, chased me away, and said I would collapse the stove where she cooked our meals. Yet, I really wanted to fool around on that stove. And the dishes that came out of it were so delicious, especially the borscht and bread cooked in such a stove. Here on the left bank in the same village where the Troitskaya church stands, a few more or less intact old huts covered with reeds have survived. Nobody lives in them anymore. Why were they covered with reeds instead of straw? Because the left bank of the Dnieper is lowland, with many marshy areas and reed-covered patches. People collected reeds and used them to cover roofs and insulate the exterior walls of houses. On the rocky right bank of the Dnieper, there are few places where reeds grow. Therefore, long stalks of wheat and rye were used, which are ideal for making roofs. But it's not just the roofs that distinguish the mud huts of the left bank from those on the right bank. The construction of the walls also differs. On the left bank initially, a brick belt was laid around the perimeter of the mud hut above ground level. On this belt, formwork was erected, and it was filled with a mixture of clay and straw up to the desired height, then left to dry. We continue our journey. Ahead of us await amazing discoveries. This little church has been standing in the village of Koshmak since 1901. In 1929, the church was closed, its domes and bell tower were dismantled, and it was turned into a community center, like many other churches across the country. During the German occupation, religious services were temporarily reinstated, but with the return of Soviet rule, the services were once again halted. Today, the church has been returned to the believers, and services are held there on weekends. I appreciate old churches. They have a soul and an attraction. Modern temples, on the other hand, often exude commercialism and showiness. Perhaps it's a good thing that the church was repurposed as a community center in those distant times. It contributed to its preservation. Otherwise, it might have decayed or burned down, like many others. Today, thanks to local activists, the church is slowly being restored. This is Alexander, a resident of the village, and a local activist who cares deeply about Ukraine's historical heritage. Ух ты! Помещение, Так тут, оказывается, 
Ну, ми все забрали, там іконостас красивий, ікони нові, все було. От ця краска, та, що була ізначально, да? А потолок уже зробили новий чи старий? Ну, там ж купола, а то ремонт зробили ми, бачите, в Алтаю. Викрасили все цей. Ух ти, а колись було це все вивезено, там комора якась була, була, чи щось таке, да? І клуб, і комора була. Заходи, заходи. Надпись почитати. Красив тришу 906 год. Ан Руденко. І куди це веде? Ну це була дзвінниця, мабуть. Це була дзвінниця, мабуть. Тобто там далі там тупі. Ще й ікони старі. Ось всі дерева. Ти в горіху в мене був. А мої є. А сейчас я зайду в один из дворов, который рядом с церковью. Вот, вот так вот живут украинцы. Вот, смотрите, какой забор. Красивый. Лечки висят. Лопата от прялки. Вот. А вот и само колесо от прялки висит. Вот о, смотрите, как все тут. А вот и катки вот эти. О, смотри, какая вообще. А это вот хозяин нас пригласил к себе. Да, да, я так и понял. Вот снимай. Вообще. Все зарубил своими руками. Олександр, знімався в фільмі про Івана Богуна? Іван Богун. Іван Богун, так і називають? Так, Іван Богун. Можна я вам зараз дам кризіт, я стелю. Ну, а це як з любові зроблено. А ви кажете, в культурі працюєте? 40 років батько за кубом, і я вже 17. Олександр, ви для своєї жінки зробили. Так? Ви кажете? Я уявляю, яка тут красавка. А ви, а звідки? А ви, старосіння. These ruins are the remnants of the Intercession Church, built in 1862 in the village of Tarasha. In reality, this church was constructed 120 years earlier, in 1743. As the village expanded over time and the space became insufficient, the decision was made to dismantle the old church and construct a new one using materials from the original building. With the advent of Soviet authority, churches started closing down, and the Intercession Church was no exception. It was repurposed into a community center where films were shown, dances were held, but entry into the altar area was prohibited. During World War II, church services were temporarily resumed and continued until 1953. Afterwards, the church was closed once more, and used as a storage facility for mineral fertilizers. Over time, the church gradually began to deteriorate, yet the sturdy oak beams resisted time, preventing the complete collapse of the church. In the 1980s, there were plans to restore the church, but it seems funding was lacking, 
and the structure continued to deteriorate. At that time, the bell tower and dome structure were still standing, although they no longer exist. This is approximately how the church used to look in the past. It's a pity that all of this is fading into the past. Вообще мы едем село, асфальтовая дорога, жилые дома, где кто живет, люди все ухожи на газ есть. То есть вот стояла хатка уже, ничего, а вот еще, ага, уже без крыши. Дальше едем в другое село, там церковь должна быть деревянная. This little church is over a hundred years old. Thankfully, it has managed to survive, although it has also weathered the test of time. The more I travel through the districts, the more new discoveries I make, immersing myself in the pastimes of my homeland. There is so much I didn't know and wasn't aware of. That's why each time I reverently touch the remnants of history, the fragments of which miraculously survived, passing through those dreadful times. It's such a shame that all the authentic cultural heritage was previously destroyed in pursuit of the political ambitions of that era. And now, once again, dark times loom over my homeland. A handful of Kremlin zealots have decided to destroy the peaceful people, the culture, the traditions, and impose their utopian views. They fabricated some Banderovites, Nazis, and hammered these ideas into their citizens' minds, handing them weapons and sending them to kill, destroy, burn, and rape. They renamed holidays, invented a Defender of the Fatherland Day. What defenders? They are the true aggressors and fascists. I apologize if I've spoiled anyone's mood. To end on a bit of positivity. On the outskirts of the village, I came across a structure that somewhat resembled the remnants of a fortress. A puzzle. What could it have been? I circled it from all sides, peered inside, climbed to the top, and still couldn't guess the purpose of this construction. Thick walls, arched vaults inside, passageways filled with earth. Later, I was told what it was. It turned out to be quite simple. It's just an ordinary brick kiln used for firing bricks. <laughs> <laughs>